In today's show, I'm receiving Elin Bergman, the COO of Cradlenet and founder of the Nordic Circular Hotspot. She was named the Circular Economy Queen of Sweden and LinkedIn Top Green Voice. We talk about the circular economy and a reality check of Sweden and the Scandinavian countries. What will happen once the countries will become too hot to live in and flooded with climate refugees? How to find your voice, establish a brand and become a LinkedIn Top Voice and the learnings from 15 years without flying. Without any further ado, Let's go. Ellen, welcome to Climate Insiders. Thank you so much. So how would you or your best friend describe Ellen Bergman in one sentence? <laughs> A crazy sailor environmentalist, maybe? All right. And so you were actually named uh, the Circular Economy Queen of Sweden. I don't know if that's actual, an actual title. Uh, how do you define that? What does that mean? Oh, I don't even know. It was uh, when I was doing a podcast like this, actually. Uh, there was a Swedish politician, Lawrence Tovat. He said that when I came into the room. And here she is, the circular economy queen of Sweden. And it kind of <laughs> stuck. So now, uh, yeah, it opens up doors, actually. It's very good. Uh, it, is, it is catchy. Yes, I'll I think it's be just because I'm, I'm talking about circular economy so, so much everywhere. I, I became the queen of circular economy. <laughs> so do you, are, you have multiple hats. One of them is CradleNet. And... Um, to a cradle net does a lot of advocacy. You recommend governments to set ambitious goals. You suggest a concrete action plan to achieve a you know, national circular economy goals. But let's be real for a minute. How much of this actually delivers results so far? Well, just to give a bit of background, uh, CradleNet is a business network. So we, we have like 145 companies uh, as businesses that are paying a membership fee and we teach them about circularity. They, of course, it's a network, so they're supposed to network with each other. And then we do a lot of policy and advocacy uh, initiatives as well. Um, so, well, I do see a big difference because when I started working on this uh, in this organization 10 years ago and uh, next year, uh, nobody knew what circular economy was. No, I, I could stand and, and talk about this and nobody raised their hand. And I was like, how many in here know about circular economy? And now when I do it, it's like everybody raises their hands. And I mean, we have a, a national strategy for circular economy. We have a, a roadmap uh, developed and so on. Uh, so it's it's you can really see a big, big difference. We have a circular economy action plan within the EU and so on. I wouldn't take all the credits, just uh, credit it, but I think we are part of uh, making this happen, especially in Sweden. So I do see that we have helped and made a difference. But uh, even though I say this, uh, not at all as much has happened that should have been happening. So uh, especially now we have a new government in Sweden. So it feels like we have to start over again. That's right. I wanted to kind of transition there. Sweden historically has been a, one of the good players, you know, at least in Europe. Uh, but let's talk about Sweden's position now. You've written that um, Sweden is now okay missing the climate targets. So what does that mean for people that are not too aware of the situation? Well, Sweden is not okay with missing the climate targets. It's the Swedish government that it's mm -hmm. okay with that because the Swedes, <laughs> Swedish people are in uproar and so mad because this was nothing that they were mentioning uh, when they, you know, had the election and everything. They're like, of course, we're going to meet the, you know, the climate targets. There's no, there's no debate about that. And now uh, they, they just released a budget and it shows that if we're going to do what they wanted to do with this budget, then we're not going to meet the, the Paris climate uh, agreement uh, targets that are set. And before, Sweden was like one of the most ambitious countries in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to be net neutral by 2045. Amazing, really good. Uh, and I was trying to convince them, to, you know, they, they should work more with circular economy because like between 45 and 70 percent of the carbon emissions is how we produce and consume things. So we, I needed to teach them that. So we can't just switch to renewable energies. We need to do more. But now we like we have to go back to basics and just, hey, maybe go back to having the old target again. Just don't uh, oh, don't abandon what we started a long right. time ago. Yeah. It sounds strangely familiar. The UK is going to the, under you know the same path. How much of this is a swing, meaning a temporary hold, as it is a total shift in strategy that might undermine everything that has been done for a decade well they they're not abandoning everything but the things that they're doing i mean they, they just uh, lower the carbon tax for instance for on, on fossil fuels and so on so that adds up of course onto 
uh, more emissions will be released instead of, you know, su- subsidizing more electric cars or, uh, you know, ele- renewable energies or even sustainable consumption. I mean, this is what we were hoping. We were hoping they will, you know, be- make the targets even better than the last government, mm-hmm. not going the opposite direction. So, yeah. How does that, how do you deal with this at a personal level? So you've been pushing hard. You were telling me kind of off the record that CradleNet was, you know, it was not an easy, rosy path, you know, since the start trying to make ends meet and financially finding a way. And, and now does does that fuel your your anger, fuels your determination or ah, it's a hard, hard uh, hit? Well, it is a hard hit, but for me, it's too late to be a po- uh, to be a pessimist. So mm-hmm. you just have to keep going. And I, I, I've been down this road a few times before. I mean, we had the COP15 meeting a long time ago in Copenhagen. Everybody was like so pumped. We're going to save the planet. And there was no agreement uh, and all the, you know, the air went out and, you know, all the energy. And at the same time, it, it looked like all the renewable uh, renewable energy investments were like bad investments and so on. But now we have a different story. The renewable energy investments are going like through the roof, way better than they ever expected. Solar, uh, you know, panels are installed everywhere. Uh, and also now we have something in the EU called uh, the taxonomy and CSRD, uh, where you, uh, all the companies will eventually need to report on not only you know s- climate change and biodiversity and pollution and water and marine resources, but also circular economy. So even if the, we have a bad government right now and it, it feels like a step backwards, uh, the EU will not let them not do this. Uh, which is amazing. So I'm so in love with the e- European Union right now. Uh, it's not going to be so easy for the UK. Sorry. It's a statement. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, other European c- countries that feel otherwise at the moment. So it's great. We are making one step forward. But don't you feel that the overall kind of macro trend, and if you look at, I recently wrote that there's been cops after cops after cops so many climate conferences, and yet there's a reverse correlation between the amount of conferences and the reduced emissions. Mm, They keep going up. Well, uh, putting a a COP meeting in Dubai uh, or other oil countries are are not helping, of course, because it's going to be, yeah, you know, you you get what you, (laughs) with people you you put there kind of in those meetings. And the oil lobby is going to be enormous this year. Mm -hmm. So, so that's maybe not the best strategy, but I think, I mean, we do see a difference. I mean, look, I, I don't know if you, it's the same everywhere, but in Sweden, at least, I mean, most cars are sold now are electrical cars. Even in Sweden, solar panels are everywhere. I mean, so there is a change in the business sector and also what people are buying that it doesn't really matter what the, the stupid politicians do because <laughs> this change is already happening anyway, not as fast as we were hoping, but still, uh, and I think also, I mean, people like Greta Thunberg, for instance, she made a big difference because now the young generation is not, you're just not having it anymore. And there's, uh, I mean, new, younger people coming into the work market every day and they won't do unsustainable things. So I, I am an optimist, uh, even though it's it's looking really bad at the moment. Right. And do you think, cause so beyond this idea of, of green economic growth, right, transitioning towards greener practices, more circular, do you think Sweden is ready to put the current government aside, kind of in the grand scheme of things, to decouple economic growth with resource consumption, right? The idea of embarking on a whole new societal narrative. Do you think Sweden is well positioned to lead that charge? Well, Oh, I, w- I would love to say yes, but <laughs> but I don't think so. I mean, we have an enormous, uh, enormously strong mining lobby uh, and also a forest lobby here. So we are a big extractive nation where we extract a lot of resources that don't really come back into the economy. You can see that in the circular economy gap reports, for instance. So I would love to for us to lead the change. But I think it's going to be nations like the Netherlands that don't have so many own natural resources that already have it in their backbone to uh, circulate things and be resource efficient that will go before us and, and take the lead. So, so you think the excess amount of uh, uh, wealth really generated, and let's put kind of Norway in the same basket, right, that have heavily rely on their own natural resources. They're so wealthy uh, as a result of it. They don't have this excess amount of money to justify taking that left turn quicker than the others. Mm. I mean, one could argue that Norway could finance the entire transition right now, but the dependency seems so, so, so deep. So you're, 
yeah, you, you really think that the, the ones that will transition are the ones that basically have no choice. Well, yes and no, because I mean, like you say, the, in the Nordics, we are so rich. This is why we are also leading the, the bad top list of, of overconsuming uh, research on the planet. Uh, we are on the top 10 worst list uh, on the global overconsumption, uh, over, overshoot days. Uh, and that's because we can afford buying more big cars, the, the latest ones, have multiple houses, buy new clothes every week and so on. Um, so that's a, a thing we need to wean off kind of. Uh, and it's it's going to be tougher than the nations that don't have anything already from the beginning to become circular. I mean, look at the African countries, for instance. They are already much, much more circular than us. And it's because they don't, they, they can't consume so much. So for them to transition, it's not a big leap. It's actually making their lives better if they can start sh- sharing things and and if things are better uh, quality and things. So it's, it's going to be so much easier for them to transition than for us. And I, I, I come from a more of a Mediterranean background, you know, being French, I grew up in the south of France and there's a bit of a historical confrontational culture, right? Revolutions are kind of p- part of our history. Sweden, Norway, the Nordics in general have a non-confrontational culture, right? It's you try to do your best not to make waves. So how, how do you think we can solve this current problem of without ruffling feathers? Uh, how can we seriously challenge the status quo? And, and take those countries away from this extractive nature? Well, the good thing and bad thing about the Nordics is that we are very trendy. Uh, we want to be, like you said, very good people. Uh, we mm-hmm. do love nature and so on. Uh, so we, we are very educated in these issues. But that's a different thing to actually change uh, the, the way we do things. But since we are also very trendy... We want to do to be part of the latest trends. So that could be a good thing because I always say like trends are the worst when it comes to consumption and so on. Because if we want to be trendy, which we are, we want to change clothes all the time and have the latest kitchens and, and furniture and cars and so on. But in this sense, I would love for the Swedes and the Nordic uh, other um, populations to actually jump on this trend very fast and, and keep it not as a trend, but something that will last for a long time and until we're out of this uh, climate crisis, hopefully. So uh, I'm hopeful that that would happen. Uh, here's another trend that might manifest itself in the next decade or or less, potentially, is the idea of uh, climate refugees. This is a big, big topic. Most experts agree, right? You read IPCC reports after IPCC report. Every year it keeps getting darker and gloomier. So what do we do when our countries are too hot to live in? And and immigration has been a particularly sensitive topic in Sweden uh, mm. because for historical reasons, you've opened the gates very wide and then kind of suffering the consequences. Do you think those countries, Nordic countries, are, 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 are addressing, are preparing for that debate of what do we do when the masses come? I love that you're asking these questions because this is something that I've been raising a long time. Like, hey, we already we're already feeling the effects of of the climate refugees. We opened our borders for the Syrian um, refugees. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, part of a climate refugee stream of of people because they had like an enormous drought, didn't have food, and and that turned into a conflict. And eventually we opened uh, our borders to a lot of Syrian refugees. Uh, That's not the the reason why we have uh, the super problems that we have right now. Uh, I wouldn't at all blame the Syrians. But we we let too many people in that we can't take care of. And now we have enormous uh, violence waves and shootings and bombs and things. Because, I mean, if you don't take care of a population that comes in, you don't give them jobs, you don't integrate them. The only career they can have is in in crime. But that's a, a totally different discussion, I would say. But... But I think uh, we have to talk about this more because right now we have the the um, uh, uh, Swedish Democrats that are the second biggest party. They're uh, uh, historically the, the racist party. They're always uh, saying that we need to close the borders and everything. But I'm trying to tell them that, hey, they should be not the climate skeptics, but actually super, uh, you know, um, aware of, of what's going on, what's going to happen to Sweden, because we are going to 
in Sweden, probably it's going to be good to live, even though it's going to be colder and rainier, probably. It's not going to be hotter. So it's going to be mm-hmm. more, even more terrible to live in, in the winter and so on. <laughs> and, but we're going to take a lot of the, of the climate refugees because we have a lot of surface. We have a lot of land where, the, where we have no, basically oh, no population anymore. So where will they come? They will come to us. So they should be you know, making sure we don't have a climate emergency because otherwise they will mm. get all these immigrants that they don't want. Uh, but they don't see a link, which I, I think is very fascinating. They just don't want to read the science, I guess. Yeah, it's, it's such a, a, a it's still a taboo topic, right? Not just in Sweden, the rest of Europe or even in the US where it, does, it seems just too far out. But it's mm. it clearly bound to happen. The Syrians, uh, there's just so many. Right. You could list a whole list, you know, of, of countries that are suffering the consequences of climate catastrophe. And also it's very hard. It's actually extremely hard for scientists to know what's going to happen between. Mm-hmm. And some are saying that it's going to be hotter. Some are saying it's going to be rainier. And, and some are even saying now with the Gulf Stream stopping, maybe we'll have an ice age. I mean, maybe Sweden will even, it's, maybe we can't even live here, here. And then it's going to be even more, worse. So we don't know. Yeah, it's just, a, uh, it's just a more unpredictable. So Norway, for mm. example, had suffered uh, the, the biggest rainfalls of the last decades, you know, over the, the, the course of July and August, when it was a total drop the year before. So yes. it just swings from one side to the other. So it's it makes those Sweden. places in the we, north. Yeah, we exactly. had the very, very hot summers before. We even, uh, the groundwater disappeared. Uh, we had fires everywhere. This summer, it's been extremely cold, rainy all the time. And even... Now, with the government got so criticized because they they uh, uh, slashed the the climate adaption budget, and the day or two days after, it was an enormous landslide on the west coast where just basically the whole freeway was just you know moved. That never happened before in Sweden. So it's like almost ironically how how nature is trying to tell us something like, hey, maybe slashing the climate adaption budget wasn't the smartest idea. Because look at what's going to happen. Yeah. And has there been any moments when you started losing hope, right? When dealing with government or any of the public sector where clearly they're not up to the task? No, I, I like I said, it's too late to be a pessimist. So that just gives me more energy to just really try to get my message across. Uh, I mean, I meet people that are climate skeptics, not so much anymore. I used to much more, but I mean, there's still so much in action. And I'm just trying to to make them understand that, hey, it's going to be so much more expensive if you're going to wait. Uh, and mm. it's going to actually make you money if you act now. So it's just, uh, uh, yeah, you just try to work, communicate better, I guess. That's what I'm trying to do. There is a lot of money to be, to be made being ahead of the trend, uh, anticipating ahead of the trend, preparing a nation so that you are the best position. And uh, actually, you and I were saying that there's, a lot of money to be made in saving the world. Yeah. Even that pure concept. Do, do you feel like the, um, the stance are, are moving here? There's a new configuration of uh, asset managers and money ma- you know, makers and j- jumping on that trend now. Yeah, I'm actually very fascinated about this because uh, there was a bank, you know, HSBC, very big uh, mm-hmm. in Vietnam that made this big report uh, showing that circular economy will be worth $4.5 trillion by 2030. And... 25 trillion dollars by 2050 so i mean there's enormous money here just to take care of the resources we have we can see that now with inflation and everything uh, materials and components are you know the, it's going to be more and more expensive going forward so if you're in the business of make, making sure that we you know the, the the resources we have are circulated or the components that we have last for a longer time and more high quality things then you're in the right business because it's going to be enormous money in there. Uh, now we're just wasting these precious resources. And it's, it's, we're basically burning money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And has there any be, been any core beliefs of yours that have fundamentally changed on how you view the whole climate ecosystem um, and, and entrepreneurship any, over the last couple of years? No, I wouldn't say uh, completely changed my view on the ecosystem, I, I, have, I wouldn't say, but maybe uh, more of, of things. Because uh, before, uh, I was always like, yeah, I thought it was not so nice if you had a Rolex watch, for instance. And I was like, mm. oh, you have this big, expensive, stupid thing on your arm, and it's worth so much money. And it's like, you could do so much better with that money. But now it's like, but that watch is made for to last for generations. 
So maybe it's not such a stupid mm. thing. It's more like with what we did a hundred years ago. You bought a suit. It was very expensive. It, it cost so much money to buy just one suit, but it was made to be, you know, high quality, made to be repaired, upgraded, and so on. Uh, and you had it for many, many, many years. And this is the same with the Rolex watch. Nobody goes and throw it away in on the garbage dump, you know. Uh, you fix it. It's it's made to be fixed, and you know every ten years they do do a, like a checkup on the watch, and then uh, it gains value. It doesn't lower the value. It gains value, and you give it to your sons, and you know it's or your daughters. Mm. Um, it's it's a thing that you inherit. So so I can I think I kind of changed my view of things, and and really maybe expensive quality things. I don't think everybody will walk around with a Rolex on their arm, but you know the, what I mean. <laughs> the, it's a good if example. Only, yeah, that is, it is a good example. If only people did that for the right reasons, right? Instead of social status and recognition. Yes. And I pr profoundly believe that this is the biggest effort that we should do as communicators to make sure that there's a shift in our societal values so that we don't recognize as success and symbols of success, just the same things that are completely, you know, pushing to overconsumption and lack of, you know, self appreciation, and mm. instead just, uh, you know, anchoring in on something that is much more healthier and and more sustainable. Exactly. And um, any other aha moment that you've had a lot last couple of years, just in this, you know, go cruising around in Europe, uh, trying to convince people, any kind of stories you could share on. Well, I'm I'm very much into at the moment regenerative farming. I don't know if you know what it is, but that's like, oh, this can potentially save the world, and it's so amazing. It's kind of us terraforming the planet, mm. uh, and it's a big trend now in Portugal and Spain. They uh, people are buying up depleted um, farmland, which is basically desert, stone deserts. There's nothing growing there. It used to be farmland and it was badly managed and now it's desert. So they buy it and they start to farm regenerate, uh, regeneratively on them, which means that they're basically, first of all, growing things that are very drought uh, resilient. Uh, and they make some um, stretches with uh, trees first, and then they make some stretches with, with food plants. So it could be whatever, salad, artichoke, tomatoes, whatever. And that eventually, the way you regeneratively farm something will make the, the soil grow back. It will make the carbon being, you know, sequestered in, in the soil. Uh, and eventually it takes about 18 months to get a forest going, a food forest. And that's so cool because what happens then after a while, when you make this in a bigger, uh, big enough scale, the rain comes back. It's so cool. Basically making the desert bloom again. And if we can do that in Spain and Portugal, we can do that anywhere. And this is something that's coming up more and more. And I'm, I'm like uh, looking at all the, the YouTube videos and everything I can find about this because I think it's so amazing. And it gives me hope. Actually, Alan Savory from South Africa did a TED Talk in 2013. I can't believe it's 10 years ago. I know. And he said that whole trend is one of the most successful TED Talks of all time. And, and he was describing the regenerative, uh, you know, farming, grazing, as he calls it. Mm. And um, it's very much using the, um, the livestock to basically graze and then hash the ground and then use the pee in the poo to basically regenerate the... And, and there's actually research, because at the beginning, it was uh, mind-blowing that such a, you know, a, mm. a very old school technique could actually regenerate the land much faster than other, you know, chemical-based techniques. And there's been research kind of proving it wrong or saying that it was not really fully mastered. So I don't know where we stand now, 10 years in to the, this, this Well, the, the type of farming I was talking about, they didn't even have animals. It's, it's, it's just growing things. But I mean, uh, the, the things that you were talking about is more like how can we regenerative savanna and, and, and mm -hmm. other where, where we have uh, grazing animals. So that's another thing. But it's also, I mean, uh, if you look at farms that are doing everything re regeneratively, not only, you know, growing crops and things, but also have it in connection with the uh, animals that are grazing and things. You can always see like there's a harsh line between the, the conventional, not sustainable way of farming and those farms because they are green and it's lush and it's it's beautiful. So, I mean, there must be some science working here because it's it's a big difference. Right. Since you mentioned Regen Ag, which is as a VC is considered one of those kind of sectors that we were considering investing in. Are you a technologist? Do you think that we should invest more in technological innovation? Do you think part of uh, what, what will save us is there? 
or it's much more in using, leveraging what we have and then mm. routing the capital to it. I, I'm, I'm a tech nerd. I love technology, but I don't think it's <laughs> going to save us. I think we uh, I think we need to use every tool in our toolbox to, to, to fix this. Uh, and I don't think like carbon capture and storage, for instance, I don't believe in it at all. But I think, uh, I mean believe it's not believing it's science <laughs> so it's not like i'm a religious person that believes in one thing or another what i've read about the science it's not working it's too little it costs too much and it's not effective but when it comes to bio ccs uh, you know when you can actually mm -hmm. take carbon and put it into the ground so it, it stays there biochar and so on yes it works but then i mean how good it works we need to figure out also by science and testing it out and trying it out. And I mean, it's, there's also a limit to how much co coal you can put in the ground. So, yeah, but, but I think, um, yes, in some ways, I mean, when it comes to, you know, renewable energy technology, and I, I really am very much into uh, store, storing enormous amount of energy in the best, most sustainable way. I really like uh, the, how it looks with pumped hydro, for instance, mm -hmm. it looks very, very good and especially in places where we have a lot of mines or mountains where you basically use uh, renewable energy sources like solar and wind when the wind blows and the sun shines it's basically in, during the day and you pump up water the uh, using the over uh, the energy excess uh, you use it to pump up water either either to a higher source or uh, from a low source in a mine to a higher source in the mine uh, place in the mine uh, where where you then can use it as a hydro plant so you you uh, take the water down again through a turbine, basically. So, so that's so much better and resource efficient than having a lot of lithium iron batteries or whatever. That's like physical things because water, yeah, water is water. Uh, you don't need to create a lot of things uh, to make it. It's basically pumping up and down water. You, of course, you need pipes and things, but still uh, much more resource efficient. So I think there are some technologies that can actually help us. But first of all, I mean, in, in China, if you look at the renewable energy transition there, yes, they're, be they're building more solar and wind and hydro than anybody else. Are they closing any coal power plants? No. Mm -hmm. They're just adding on more energy because they need to have more energy to, to meet the population's need. I would be very happy when they start closing coal-fired coal plants instead of building new ones. Uh, but we're not there yet. You know, it's, it, it is. A, so it, it, on the technology side, it all boils down to unit economics and price of energy, right? It, the, you can flip it the way you want. At, at the end of the day, carbon capture and storage is completely inefficient because of the energy price and the energy d demand. Desalination, we, have a, we will have wars on water and plenty of experts have spoken about this. We know the technology in Israel and the Middle East is very good at it. They're just very energy intensive. So I believe in spending as much money as possible in energy efficiency and then trying to find and crack ways. For example, nuclear fusion is one of them to enable a ton of different business models that are completely non-feasible in the current environment with the current mm. energy level. Oh, with that said, I, I met these two older guys when I did the conference like 15 years ago before COP15. They made this technology that I really loved. It was kind of like a Audio, audio thermic, I can't even remember what it was. I tried <laughs> to find them afterwards. Basically, it's like a thing you can put in a pipe. Um, so you can you can put it on a, in a stand where you have solar panels on. Mm -hmm. And if you put it in the desert where you, you want to put your solar panels, it can actually draw out moist from the air in mm. the desert up to 1,000 liters a day, which basically can make the desert bloom and make pu right. beautiful fresh water. But I can't find those guys that made this technology again because this was 15 years ago. And I was like, where are these guys? Where is the technology? It sounded so amazing. Yeah. I so do have received, I have received a similar deck, probably inspired from that technology. I will share it in, in the slide. So it was basically know. sound waves somehow, how they got yes. the, the air out. Oh, okay, good. So maybe you have it. I will share it with you. And in, I would um, invest in, in that. Notes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep your, your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> good. So talking about you personally and how you kind of stood out over the years and building your own voice so i'm always curious to know how people find their voice and maybe what would you suggest to the the younger generation to find theirs and leverage a, a platform like linting yeah good question uh yeah um so 
I can't remember where, when it was now. Maybe it was two years ago when I was frustrated about a lot of things. And, uh, you know, sometimes I was like super happy, but nobody was spreading the news that I was reading. And it's like, maybe I should, you know, start spreading what I'm reading. And, and, and I try to keep a, um, a balanced amount of I'm angry at this or I'm very hopeful about this or happy about this piece of news. Yeah. So I just started posting and and thought maybe someone agrees with me and then it was a lot of people that agreed with me so some of my posts get like uh, 300,000 wow. interactions and things it was amazing and then i got this award the linkedin top green voice um so so that was amazing and then it kind of just uh, snowballed from there and uh yeah apparently just if you have something to say don't go around having it in your own brain but actually get it out there uh because there's a lot of people that agrees with you uh, probably and uh, i mean there's a lot of people that disagrees with me especially when i do uh you know climate uh, related news after a, a day or so there's always like an army of climate skeptics uh, that comes and just uh, trolls the whole discussion but it, it is what it is and i think that's also kind of a stamp that you're doing something right because if if they're putting a right. lot of time and energy into to releasing their army on you, then you're doing something right. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just happy when the that trolls. happens. <laughs> the, the trolls, yeah. Why do you, be, you know, it all sounds easy, you know, saying, oh, I, I got this title and it snowballed from there. But one of the, the objections that a lot of people have is, how do I even get started here? I, I don't want to put myself out there. I feel vulnerable doing it. I feel judged. Did you have to overcome all this? Or did you simply kind of dissociate your virtual identity from who you are any tricks there to to make it sustainable? Well, I don't feel like that I'm separating different personalities from myself. I'm old. I'm always alien, uh, whatever I do, uh -huh. and I think that helps me because I I have the same voice when I'm standing on a stage. If I'm representing Cradlenet, if I'm re representing myself, and it's just me. Uh, so if someone has a problem, that have a problem with me, not my other persona. Th that would be just confusing for me. So I'm, I try to be as honest with myself as possible. And then if you're just honest to yourself, um, I mean, it's basically easier, I think. I think that's the key. And a lot of people still think from a corporate angle saying, oh, what will they say? Uh, will I lose my job? Uh, will I lose that promotion? And I think that's, uh, did, did, we keep hearing it over and over. Authenticity pays off. But it's mm. really hard, it seems like, still for, for the majority to be fully authentic. Yeah, I mean, th th there could be a problem. The reason why it's easier for me is because I'm running my own organizations. Of course, I have co-workers and so on. But that also helps uh, getting the message across and mm -hmm. people, uh, you know, becoming members of my networks and so on. So so that helps. But I remember when I was working for WWF, for instance, I was a circular economy expert for WWF uh, for eight years. And uh, yeah, they were saying, well, maybe Elin, uh, maybe you should run this through PR before you say something. But mm -hmm. it's like it took it. That would have taken like three weeks, uh, and that was that would make my news old. So right. after a while, I was just, uh, you know, but I'm I'm saying this for Cradlenet, not for WWF. <laughs> and they were like, yeah, we just let her do her thing. No, so That's right. so I think it's yeah. I mean, if you can't see it in one. Uh, organization maybe you can see it for the other or for yourself and you should own your own personal brand it's something that and more employers should be completely fine dissociating i i might have your label or your hat but i'm representing myself above anything else on linkedin and my social media it's yeah. very important and one way that you've been true to yourself is the idea of stopping flying altogether and you said for the last 15 years you've been just taking the train electric cars sailing how did, well, paint us a reality check here is like how painful is that how many times did you really kind of have to hesitate and did that prevent you from going far well uh yeah i remember the last time i flew very far that was to new zealand and i was like hesitant about that too that was before i just made the the, the real decision uh, but after i made the decision it wasn't it wasn't hard at all it's like uh, either i will go on vacation to a warm place. I mean, I live in Sweden. It's dark and cold in the winter and so on. Uh, or I will not do it. And then it's just either I do it and I do it in a sustainable way, taking the train or the bus or the electric car or so, or sail. Um, or I will just okay. stay at home. So it's, I mean, it's it's actually for most things that I've done, because I also, I'm a vegetarian. I don't consume anything. Uh, I try to, you know, really avoid buying new clothes and 
unnecessary things. But once you'd made the decision, it's easy. It's it's like a, it's a non-issue. It's not like I would sit in a restaurant and look at like, oh, I would, would really like to have this steak. It, it doesn't even occur to mm. me because I don't eat steak, you know? So it's it's sometimes it just makes things easier. But with that said, I have to say I'm, I'm the first one that just will salute and, and, you know, have a party when there's, a, you know, electric planes uh, that I can fly mm-hmm. again or some other sustainable, you know, sustainable uh, technology. Because taking the train, it's it's beautiful the first 10 years and then it's it gets, uh, it's very slow. And it, it's it gets a hassle, a yeah. Yeah, yeah. And also it's not like they're going on time all the time and you miss them. And, and it's also, it's very expensive uh, still. Especially from Sweden. I mean, I had to take that train um, from yeah. Malmo to Stockholm, which uh, rarely works. Six and a half, <laughs> uh, yeah, six and a half hours also. I've been there right. many, many times, yeah. So uh, does that mean that you're completely immune to social pressure? You're saying once you've made that decision, you kind of stick to it. But the problem is not you making the decision, is the judgment. The people around you that are kind of making you hesitate, saying they don't understand. And no, I, I mean, when I started doing, especially when I was uh, in my job uh, before I was like working for WWF and so on, they were like, you're not flying. And it's like, yeah, I, I stopped flying. And uh, well, actually at that time I flew for my company, but I, I wouldn't flew, fly privately. Uh, but that made I was super inspiration for many of them, and and they have now started working in in you know being climate act- activists and advocates and so on, and there there many of them are saying like oh but I got so inspired by my coworker Elin, she was the first I ever met mm. that started doing this for real, and I was like you know you have to be an inspiration for someone. I had this uh, beautiful old teacher of mine Maria Volat Söderberg in Sweden. She is a scientist and looking at what changes people's behaviors. And it's not science. It's not another IPCC report. It's people in your nearest, closest life. Right. Your friends, your family, those are who you listen to. So if they start changing, you start changing. They, someone needs to show that it's okay to do this. And then you get inspired and then you start doing it. So, so I hope to be that person for everybody around me. Now that's right. Inspiration is just so much more powerful than trying to convince through uh, narratives or at least uh, rational thinking. I abandoned a long time ago convincing my parents to switch to vegetarianism, and uh, but I realized by doing it, and then if people kind of triangulate information they get from the immediate network, they turn into vegetarians. It's the beauty of of uh, you know mimicry, and yeah. and so I, I kind of. We're, we're running out of time here, but I re- wanted to know how could we sexify this narrative of switching to full sustainable world, right? How do we make this a win and not a sacrifice? Mm. Well, that's a question that I think, <laughs> sorry, it's it's a bit stupid in some ways because it's like, otherwise we are dead, you know? So, so <laughs> I mean, what's the, there's no alternative really. So, I mean, it's it's so sad that we live in a world that this is an issue to even talk about because it's like I know uh, this should be if we just listened to every scientist in the seventies that knew about this, we wouldn't even have this problem. Now we have this sure. problem. We need to fix it, and there's no alternative. I know. So, but it feels so, like we're in "Don't Look Up," right? In that movie where oh, we yeah. will go oh, all yeah. the way to the edge, to the edge of the cliff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it's it's like. I mean, for for instance, I, I just mentioned Greta before because she's Swedish and, and she, I think she's a fantastic uh, inspiration for so many people. And you can even now m- measure the Greta effect in Austria, for instance. Like every third person in Austria have changed their ways because of Greta and the prote- protests. So if, like if everybody could be their own Greta in their own nation and, and just keep nagging on this. Uh, I mean, I do, I'm doing it for circular economy. So I'm trying to fa- change the business sector. I'm trying to do it with my closest, uh, you know, people around me, and also all of you closest people listening to this podcast. <laughs> but but it's like you do whatever you can do in your the the spheres you're in, and we will fix it. That's right. Just try to shine this light that will act as a magnet for people to follow you and to make the changes in their life. Well, we hope that will scale to millions or uh, potentially billions. Because time is running out. <laughs> yeah, I hope so too. But thanks so much, uh, Aileen, for being an inspiration. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you so Super much. Super insightful to follow your journey. 
And to all of you, thanks as always for tuning in. Mm -hmm.